Okay, so get ready to dive into some seriously mind-bending stuff because today we're tackling ring theory. Ring theory, or RT for short, offers a really intriguing alternative to the standard model of particle physics. We're talking about a whole new way to picture the atom. Forget those solid little protons and neutrons you learned about in school. Instead, imagine them as these tiny little buzzing rings of energy. Yeah, like a cosmic hula hoop show happening at the smallest level. And get this. This model might just revolutionize the way we think about things like chemical bonds. And even how those elements themselves behave. It's about uncovering this hidden elegance within the structure of matter itself. Exactly. And that's what we're here to unpack today. So to jump right in, let's talk about the elephant in the room, or rather, the T-I-N-Y elephant in the atom, the nucleus. Okay. It's this super dense area packed with positive protons, right? But here's the thing that always bugged me. If those protons all have the same charge, shouldn't they just repel each other and send the whole nucleus flying apart? It's the million-dollar question that puzzled physicists for decades. Right. The standard model says it's this thing called the strong force that glues everything together. A force totally separate from, like, gravity or electromagnetism, which right. we experience every day. Exactly. A mysterious force just for the nucleus. Right. Okay, so how does ring theory tackle this? Well, instead of introducing a completely new force... RT suggests that it's all about those ring-shaped particles and their magnetic fields. Magnetic fields? You mean like those magnets we stick on the fridge? Kind of, but way more powerful and on a much smaller scale. Okay, I'm glad to think. So picture those tiny rings, not just as static objects, but buzzing with energy. Their magnetic fields are constantly interacting, attracting, and repelling each other. Okay, so instead of a jumbled mess of positive charges all trying to get away from each other, we have this intricate dance of magnetic fields holding everything together. Exactly. And the way they link up, it's not random. It's all about the shape and orientation of those rings. Think about those magnetic construction toys where the pieces can either stick together or push each other away depending on how you tune them. Oh, right, right. It's the same principle, but happening on a subatomic level. So these rings, because of their shape and how their magnetic fields interact, can actually overcome that electrostatic repulsion that would normally make those protons scatter. That's the elegance of it. RT explains the stability of the nucleus not by invoking a mysterious strong force, but through the well-established principles of electromagnetism. That's pretty mind-blowing when you think about it. It is. It completely changes how we visualize the atom's core. It does. Okay, so we've got these rings that are attracting and repelling, but how do we go from these tiny rings to, like, the entire periodic table. How do we get all the different elements? That's where the concept of globules comes in. Globules. Well, yeah, it's a great word. So in ring theory, a globule is a cluster of up to 10 protons and neutrons, all held together in this tight little group by those strong, short-range magnetic interactions we were talking about. Wait, so instead of just a random scattering of these ring-shaped particles, they're actually forming these little gangs, these globules. Exactly. And the size of the gang, so to speak, is limited by how closely those rings can pack together due to their magnetic fields. So it's like this delicate balance, right? Yeah. Too close, and the magnetic fields push them apart too far, and they're not strong enough to hold them together. Exactly. It's like they're all trying to find their perfect spot in this subatomic mosh pit. And here's where it gets even more wild. Neutrons, you know, those neutral particles that don't have a charge, they actually play a critical role in all of this. Wait, really? I always thought of neutrons as kind of just taking up space. They're often seen as the wallflowers of the atom, but they're far from passive in ring theory. Okay, so if they don't have a charge, how do they influence anything? Well, according to RT, neutrons also have what's called a magnetic moment which is kind of like their own mini magnetic field, but it's the opposite of a proton's. Opposite, so like how the north pole of one magnet attracts the south pole of another. Exactly. So those neutrons, they act as mediators within the globule, helping to balance out those positively charged protons and allowing for more complex and stable structures to form. Think of them like the peacekeepers of the nucleus, smoothing over interactions and preventing everything from flying apart. Wow, so each neutron is like strategically placed to keep the peace and maximize those attractions. You got it. It's a delicate balancing act dictated by those ring-shaped particles and their magnetic fields. It's like a perfectly choreographed dance, but <laughs> instead of dancers, we have protons and neutrons. So this interplay between the protons and neutrons, their shapes, their magnetic fields, that's what determines the different elements. Precisely. Each element, 
from simple hydrogen with its single proton to those massive unstable elements can be thought of as a unique arrangement of these ring-shaped particles, these globules within globules. It's like those Russian nesting dolls, but for atomic nuclei. <laughs> so much cooler than just picturing them as boring little spheres. Uh, but what about the quarks? Where do they fit into this whole ring-shaped party? Ah, uh, yes. The quarks. Now, in the standard model, quarks are these fundamental particles that make up protons and neutrons. Right. But here's where RT takes a sharp turn. It suggests that quarks themselves might actually be composed of even smaller ring-like structures. Hold on. Are you saying we have rings within rings? In a way, yes. Like those Russian dolls, there might be even smaller structures within those we thought were fundamental. Okay, my mind is officially blown. And what's even wilder, RT proposes that these smaller rings, the ones potentially making up the quarks, could be derived from wait for it electrons and positrons electrons and positrons but those are like each other's arch nemesis aren't they always trying to annihilate each other in a burst of pure energy they are in the traditional sense but ring theory suggests that under certain conditions those electron positron pairs instead of annihilating each other completely they become twisted together and that's how you get a quark so you're saying those particles that are supposed to destroy each other could actually be the building blocks of even smaller particles. Exactly. It's like the universe has this incredible knack for turning seemingly opposing forces into the fundamental ingredients of reality. Okay, now that is seriously mind-bending. We've got rings, globules, quarks, potentially made of even tinier rings. Mm. This is a whole new level of intricate. So where do we even go from here? What are the implications of all of this? Well, for one, it changes how we look at those subtle variations within elements, the isotopes. Isotopes, right, like carbon-12 versus carbon-14, the kind they use for carbon dating. Exactly. In the standard model, isotopes are just atoms with the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons, making them heavier or lighter versions of the same element. Right. But Ling theory suggests that those extra neutrons in an isotope are not just passively hanging out. They're actively influencing the shape and stability of the entire nucleus. So it's not just a numbers game. It's more like each isotope has its own unique architecture within the nucleus thanks to those neutrons. Precisely. And that has huge implications for how we understand things like radioactive decay and nuclear reactions, and even how elements form in stars. Hey. It gets even more interesting when we look at how RT might change our understanding of chemical bonds. You know, those bonds that hold atoms together to form molecules. They're kind of a big deal. Right. It's what makes chemistry, well, chemistry. It's how we get all these amazing substances that make up our world. Exactly. And we often learn about these bonds as if electrons are just randomly buzzing around the nucleus. But what if the nucleus itself is this precisely structured dynamic entity with those magnetic fields emanating from the ring-shaped particles? That would definitely shake things up a bit. Instead of just feeling the overall positive charge of the nucleus, those outer electrons would be influenced by the specific arrangement of those ring-shaped protons and neutrons inside, wouldn't they? You got it. It's like those magnetic fields are acting as invisible scaffolding, guiding those electrons into very specific configurations, and that's what determines how those atoms can bond with others. Wow. Okay. So how does that play out in, say, covalent bonds? That's where atoms share electrons. Exactly. In traditional chemistry, we explain covalent bonds through the overlapping of electron orbitals, those regions around the nucleus where electrons are most likely to be found. Right. I remember that from chemistry class. But RT suggests that it's actually the magnetic fields created by those ring-shaped protons that draw those shared electrons in, creating that bond. So instead of just randomly bumping into each other and deciding to share, those electrons are being guided by those tiny ring-shaped conductors within the nucleus. Precisely. And because the arrangement of those rings is unique to each element, it means that each element will have its own specific way of forming covalent bonds, its own little dance that it does with other atoms. Okay, that makes sense. But what about other types of bonds, like ionic bonds? That's where one atom basically steals an electron from another, right? Exactly. And RT can explain those, too. It all comes down to the relative strengths of those nuclear magnetic fields. The atom with the stronger field, again, due to the unique arrangement of its rings, will exert a greater pull on those electrons, making it more likely to snag one from a weaker neighbor. It's like a subatomic tug-of-war, and the nucleus with the best magnetic grip wins. Exactly. It all comes back to those rings and their remarkable properties. Okay, this is definitely making me rethink everything I thought I knew about how atoms interact with each other. 
It's not just some random chemical attraction, but a carefully choreographed dance dictated by those tiny rings inside. But let's zoom out a bit. We've talked about the nucleus, the ring sheet particles, the implications for chemical bonds. But what about the bigger picture implications of ring theory? How does this change our understanding of the universe as a whole? That's where it gets really exciting. For instance, ring theory might completely change how we understand the electromagnetic force itself. You mean like one of the four fundamental forces of nature, the one responsible for everything from light to electricity to magnetism? The very same. In the standard model, electromagnetism is carried by photons. Those massless particles of light that zip around the universe. Exactly. But ring theory suggests that even photons might have a more complex ring-like structure. Wait, seriously, are you saying that even light itself might be made up of these tiny little rings? That's one of the most intriguing possibilities. Imagine photons, not as these point-like particles, but as tiny oscillating bundles of energy constantly interacting with their surroundings. Okay, I'm trying to picture that. It's like each photon is a tiny vibrating ring of energy instead of a tiny bullet of light. Exactly. And this could explain some of the weird and wonderful properties of light that have puzzled physicists for centuries, like its wave-particle duality. You see, sometimes light behaves like a wave, and sometimes it behaves like a particle, and it's never quite clear which one it truly is. It's one of those mysteries of quantum mechanics that makes you question the nature of reality. Precisely. But if photons have this ring-like structure, as RT suggests, it could offer a more intuitive explanation. Those wave-like properties might be a result of the overall motion of the photon, that ring of energy propagating through space, while the particle-like behavior could come from the way those rings interact with matter on a very small scale. So light wouldn't be one or the other, but both at the same time, just depending on how we're looking at it. It's like that old saying, is it a rabbit or a duck? But for photons... You've got it! And that has huge implications. It could even help us understand why the speed of light is constant no matter how fast you're moving relative to it. Something that Einstein's theory of relativity beautifully describes but that we still haven't fully explained. Well, wow, okay. So ring theory isn't just giving us a new picture of the atom. It's potentially rewriting our understanding of light and the very fabric of space-time. That's the incredible thing about it. It challenges us to rethink some of our most fundamental assumptions about how the universe works. And speaking of fundamental assumptions, let's talk about something that's always captured my imagination. Antimatter. Antimatter, right. It's like the evil twin of matter, always trying to destroy it. That's the popular image. In the standard model, antimatter is this rare, exotic substance that annihilates matter on contact. But what if it's not so rare after all? What if it's actually hidden within the fabric of matter itself? Wait, are you saying that antimatter could be lurking inside of us right now? That's one of the most radical ideas proposed by RT. Remember how we talked about how those electron-positron pairs might become twisted together to form quarks? What if, instead of completely annihilating each other, they get trapped in that twisted state, forming the very building blocks of matter? So antimatter wouldn't be this separate exotic entity, but an integral part of matter itself, just woven into its very essence. Exactly. It's like discovering that the universe has been hiding one of its biggest secrets right under our noses. Yeah. Of course, it wouldn't behave like the antimatter we see in particle accelerators. It wouldn't just annihilate everything around it. But it would be there, subtly influencing the properties of matter in ways we're only beginning to understand. That's mind-blowing. So... Ring theory isn't just rewriting our textbooks on atoms and chemistry. It's potentially changing our whole understanding of the universe's ingredients. It's like discovering that flour, that essential baking ingredient, is actually made up of two other ingredients that are constantly trying to destroy each other. That's a great analogy. And just like a master baker can combine those volatile ingredients to create something delicious, the universe might be using the interplay between matter and antimatter to create the amazing diversity and complexity we see around us. That's a pretty awesome thought. But antimatter aside, I'm curious, are there any practical applications of ring theory? Well, it's still a very young theory, but its potential applications are vast. For one, it could revolutionize our understanding of nuclear fusion, the process that powers the sun. Nuclear fusion, right. Yeah. That holy grail of clean energy that scientists have been trying to crack for decades. The very same. And one of the biggest challenges with fusion is understanding and controlling the incredibly complex forces at play within the nucleus of an atom. 
But if RT is correct, and those forces are primarily magnetic in nature, it could open up entirely new avenues for designing and building fusion reactors. So instead of just trying to brute force our way to fusion, we could learn to work with the natural magnetic dances of those ring-shaped particles. Exactly. We could potentially create a more elegant, more efficient way to unlock the incredible energy stored within the atom's heart. That would be incredible. Clean, nearly limitless energy from a process that mimics the stars themselves. It's like something straight out of science fiction. It is. And that's just the beginning. Ring theory could also have profound implications for our understanding of how elements form in stars, the behavior of black holes, even the very nature of dark matter and dark energy, those cosmic mysteries that make up the vast majority of the universe, but that we still don't understand. Okay, now you're just showing off. But seriously, it's incredible to think that this one idea, this one shift in perspective about the structure of the atom, could potentially unlock so many mysteries of the universe. And we've only just scratched the surface. But there's one more area where RT could have a huge impact, and it's one that's close to my heart, carbon. Carbon, as in the backbone of all life as we know it. Okay, you have my attention. What does ring theory have to say about carbon? Well, carbon is amazing because it's so versatile. It can form these incredibly complex and diverse molecules, everything from the simple methane and natural gas to the intricate DNA that makes up our genes. Right. Carbon is like the Lego brick of the molecular world. It can connect to itself and other atoms in so many ways, creating an astonishing variety of structures. Exactly. And in traditional chemistry, we explain carbon's versatility through the concept of hybrid orbitals, where its electrons can kind of rearrange themselves to form different types of bonds. So, like, carbon's electrons have multiple personalities, changing roles depending on the molecule they're in. That's a great way to put it. But here's the thing. Ring theory suggests that those hybrid orbitals aren't actually necessary. It's all about the nucleus again. Of course, it always comes back to those rings, doesn't it? It does. It's the specific arrangement of those ring-shaped protons and neutrons in the carbon nucleus that dictates how its electrons behave, guiding them into those different bonding configurations. So it's like the nucleus is the puppet master, and those electrons are just dancing to its tune. <laughs> Precisely. And because the arrangement of those rings in carbon is so specific, it creates these highly directional magnetic fields, which act as a blueprint for how those electrons will interact with other atoms. This could explain why carbon forms such strong, stable bonds, and why it's so good at forming those long chains and complex structures that are essential for life. Okay, so not only is ring theory changing our understanding of atoms and forces, it's potentially giving us a whole new perspective on the chemistry of life itself. That's the beauty of it. It's a theory with far-reaching implications, touching on every aspect of the universe, from the smallest particles to the largest structures, from the origins of the universe to the very essence of life itself. It's a lot to wrap your head around. But speaking of wrapping our heads around things, I'm curious about something. We've been talking about ring theory as this alternative to quantum mechanics. But are they really mutually exclusive? Could there be a way to reconcile these two models? That's a fantastic question, and one that physicists are actively debating right now. Some see ring theory as a complete replacement for quantum mechanics, while others believe that it could be integrated into the existing framework of quantum theory, offering a new perspective on some of its most puzzling aspects. So it's not necessarily a case of one being right and the other being wrong but more about finding the connections and commonalities between these different models. Precisely. Perhaps by combining the insights of ring theory with the mathematical tools of quantum mechanics, we can unlock an even deeper understanding of the universe. It's like those two models are like different pieces of the same puzzle, and it's up to us to figure out how they fit together. But while we're on the topic of quantum mechanics, one thing that's always blown my mind is this concept of entanglement. Ah, yes, quantum entanglement, where two particles become linked no matter how far apart they are, so that measuring the state of one instantly influences the state of the other. It's like they have this spooky, invisible connection that transcends space and time. It is one of the strangest and most counterintuitive aspects of quantum mechanics. And you know what? Ring theory might actually be able to shed some light on that as well. Really? Okay, now you've piqued my interest. Tell me more. Well, in the standard model, entanglement is often described as this mysterious, non-local connection, as if those particles are communicating with each other faster than the speed of light. 
But remember how we talked about how in ring theory, even seemingly empty space is teeming with these tiny oscillating rings of energy that make up the fabric of space time. Right. It's like the universe is doing the wave at the smallest possible level. Exactly. And some physicists believe that those rings could actually provide the mechanism for entanglement. Imagine those entangled particles, not as isolated entities, but as being connected through this network of oscillating rings that permeates all of space. So instead of sending signals faster than light, those entangled particles are actually just influencing the very fabric of space-time around them, and those ripples propagate through that network to instantly affect the other particle. Precisely. It's like those two particles are two boats bobbing on a vast interconnected ocean. They may seem separate, but they're linked through the water itself, and any disturbance created by one boat will eventually reach the other, no matter how far apart they are. That makes so much more sense than particles somehow talking to each other faster than the speed of light. It's like that interconnectedness is baked into the very fabric of reality. Exactly. And that has profound implications for our understanding of everything from the nature of information to the limits of what we can know about the universe. Okay, my mind is officially blown. Again. But on that note, I think we need to take a break and let our listeners process all of this mind-bending information. We'll be right back after a short break to continue our deep dive into ring theory. And it's not just entanglement. Ring theory could also have profound implications for our understanding of some of the biggest mysteries in cosmology, like dark matter and dark energy. Right. Those elusive entities that make up the vast majority of the universe, but seem to interact with normal matter and energy in very strange ways. Exactly. We can detect their gravitational influence. We can see how they affect the expansion of the universe, but we still have no idea what they're made of. It's like trying to understand the rules of a game when you can't even see the players. A cosmic game of hide-and-seek. So, where does ring theory fit into all of this? Well, because it offers this radical new perspective on the nature of matter and energy, some physicists believe that it might hold the key to unlocking the secrets of dark matter and dark energy. Okay, I'm intrigued. Tell me more. For example, one idea that's being explored is that dark matter could be made up of ring-shaped particles, similar to those we've been discussing, but with different properties, properties that make them invisible to our telescopes and detectors, but still able to exert a gravitational pull. So like a whole other set of ring-shaped particles dancing to their own tune, but instead of forming atoms, they're forming the scaffolding of entire galaxies and galaxy clusters. Exactly. They would be like the invisible glue holding the universe together, and their unique properties dictated by their ring-like nature could explain why they've been so difficult to detect. That's a mind-blowing thought. It's like we've been looking for the missing pieces of the universe in all the wrong places, and maybe, just maybe, ring theory is pointing us in the right direction. That's the exciting part. It's opening up these whole new avenues of exploration, these new ways of thinking about some of the most fundamental questions in physics and cosmology. It certainly makes you realize how much we still don't know about the universe and how even our most well-established theories are always open to revision. That's the beauty of science. It's not about being right or wrong, but about constantly questioning, testing, and refining our understanding of the world around us. And who knows, maybe ring theory with its elegant simplicity and its potential to unify so many different areas of physics will be the key to unlocking some of the universe's greatest mysteries. Well, I think it's safe to say that this deep dive into ring theory has left me with more questions than answers, but in the best way possible. I'm glad to hear that. It means we've sparked your curiosity and that's what we always aim for. It's definitely given me a whole new perspective on how the universe might work and I have a feeling I'll be thinking about those tiny buzzing rings for a long time to come. As you should. They might just hold the key to understanding everything. Well, on that note, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your incredible insights on this fascinating topic. It's been my pleasure. Always happy to talk about the wonders of ring theory. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us on this mind-bending journey. We hope you've enjoyed exploring the elegant and surprising world of ring theory as much as we have. Until next time, keep those minds open and keep asking those big questions.